years ago, I found myself on the phone with my credit card company, promising to pay off my bill by having a yard sale. I had just relocated from Canada to the UK, and things were not panning out in my career as an actor in a way that I'd hoped for. I had managed to burn through my savings, rack up 10,000 pounds of credit card debt, and I'd just broken up with my long-term, long-distance, on-again, off-again boyfriend for the fifth and final time. <laughs> Pausing to take stock, the ledger of my life seemed like a big zero. When I got off the phone with my credit card company, I looked around my flat, and I realized that the only things I could sell, the only things I owned that were worth anything monetarily, had all been given to me by my different ex-boyfriends. I had eight objects from eight different exes to sell. I had a vintage typewriter, an acoustic guitar, a bicycle, a sapphire necklace, a denim Herschel backpack from before they went mainstream, and a teapot, a t-shirt, and a mixed CD. I began my pricing with my sapphire necklace, which was a gift for my 19th birthday from my boyfriend at the time, and for which I suffered a flesh wound. Sort of. On the day of my 19th birthday, I took a, a bus to see my boyfriend, and on the bus, someone had wedged a box cutter, a scalpel, between the seats, but I didn't notice the blade until I moved to get comfortable, and the knife sliced through my new jeans, through the flesh of my bum, drawing blood. So, do you think that flesh wound increases or decreases the value of the necklace that he gave me? Increase, right? And what if I told you that the first person I ever had sex with is the person who gave me this necklace? Increase. And what if I told you that sapphires have gone up in demand by 2,000% since Kate Middleton started wearing a sapphire ring? And what if I told you that my first thought when I opened this gift on my 19th birthday was, now I can never break up with him? <laughs> And what if I told you that when I interviewed the guy who gave me this necklace as research for this project, he confessed that he has no memory of ever having bought me a necklace. <laughs> so I didn't know. I didn't know how to price any of my objects given factors like those, but I figured there must be some formula out there that could do it. Now, at this point, I decided to forego my yard sale and instead play the long game. I was going to capitalize on my items by creating a theater show about my quest to determine what the stuff from our exes is actually worth. I called the show The Ex-Boyfriend Yard Sale, and I got to work. I began my artistic process by contacting the best mathematical minds that I know, and a whole bunch of brainiacs weighed in over the development period, but my main source of help with my pricing predicament was a math expert named Melanie Phillips. She agreed to work with me to create a formula that took into account all the factors I believed to be relevant, such as how long the relationship lasted, who broke up with who, the ratio of fun to misery during the relationship, <laughs> the time spent pining before we got together, how good the sex was, who paid for more things during the relationship, the purchase price of the object in question, its appreciation or depreciation, was there ever unspeakable bliss, was I in love, how much I cried during the relationship, i.e. should a crying tax be applied or deducted for his suffering for any object given to me before 2012, which was when I started seeing a psychotherapist. <laughs> and wild card factors. So the plan was to take all of these variables, also known as data points and many more, figure out how to weigh them, figure out how they relate to each other, to create a mathematical formula for the cost of love so we can all know if it was worth it. <laughs> My next task was to fill in a spreadsheet with information for all of my data points for every single one of my objects after slogging through this data entry process, which involved looking through my old diaries and emails, combing through bank statements and phone records, I then had to sort the data points into broad categories. Initially, I had four. 
Market value is all the data points associated with the object itself. Time invested is about, yes, how long the relationship lasted, but also things that put a strain on time. How much long distance did you have to do? And what was the timing of the relationship itself? The relationship index is all the nitty gritty stuff that you can assess for just about any romance, like how good the sex was, how hard they made you laugh. Oh, and everything in the relationship index is rated on a scale from one to 10, except we don't use the number seven. And this is because I was listening to a podcast and I heard a business mogul say that seven is a lukewarm cop-out number. <laughs> the number seven has no balls. And I wanted to do strong math. The final uh, category is narrative impact, which captures the value of a relationship in retrospect. Um, did it contribute any great stories to your life story? Did you acquire any important skills in the relationship, like how to make pancakes without a recipe, for example? Each of these categories then became a phrase in the formula for the cost of love. There's the first draft. Oh, and we also had our wild cards, which we decided would be like taxes and credits and would be applied or deducted if a specific wild card experience was part of a particular relationship. For example, a wild card could be feeling extremely guilty about something or being betrayed. So, in the aftermath of my relationship with the guy who gave me the typewriter, not only did I learn that he'd been pursuing and wooing other women the entire time we'd been together, but he pursued and wooed those other women using the same tactics and tools he used on me. He had a pattern. The pattern began with a Facebook message proposing this must be the place by the talking heads as our song, followed by a series of E.E. E. Cummings poems, followed by a dinner at a now defunct restaurant in Toronto's Little Portugal. So, I wanted to do some aftermath math to figure out the cost of being put through this pattern and how it related to the value of the typewriter. So we wrote, the bad shit happened to me wild card. And this uh, mathematical phrase spits out a number that becomes a tax, essentially, that is applied to the overall price of the typewriter. It seemed apt to use the litigious precedent of suing for damages and get compensated for bad shit because the impact of bad shit can become our baggage and baggage can cost us. My artistic process also involved talking to experts in economics, market research, and finance, and interviewing some of my exes, one of whom pointed out to me that the ticket sales to the show, as well as any notoriety I gained as a result of the show, were, was actually uh, a way I was profiting from my ex-boyfriends, and he said I should be transparent about that. I also learned about an economic theory that says a dollar today is always worth more than a dollar tomorrow because we can use our time between today and tomorrow to apply our skills, which would be storytelling in my case, to enrich our assets, which would be my objects. With this in mind, we added a new phrase to the formula to take into account how the show was adding value, and we called it dollar today. Actually, every uh, conversation with an ex brought forth material that needed to be folded into the formula. Two and a half years into dating the guy who gave me the bicycle, our idyllic romance had devolved into a dynamic where I wanted to go for brunch and he wanted to save his money for a down payment on a property. Every coffee not made at home became a tiny battleground where our values rivaled each other. We were arguing all the time, and even though I didn't want to, eventually I said, maybe we should break up, and he said, that would be a relief. <laughs> so we did. This table evaluates who broke up with who from least to most brutal. In a straightforward <laughs> breakup scenario, as you can see, the most brutal is when you don't want the relationship to end, but you realize your partner does. However, they're too afraid to actually end it, and so you take matters into your own hands and end the relationship on their behalf. When I talked to the guy who gave me the bicycle as research for the show, I found myself lying to him about how often I meditate and how much money I had in my savings account that I had a savings account. And <laughs> I realized, even though I hardly think of him, 
He remains an impressive person I desire to impress, who I really like, love even. And we created a wild card called the Martha card, uh, Martha from the Tom Waits song. It's okay if you don't know the song. The Martha card, um, <laughs> the Martha card represents those rare people who, no matter what the outcome is with them, they occupy a space in you that no one else can touch, and that is somehow divine. And it adds 10% to the overall value of any object they may have given you. So, um, yes. <laughs> Melanie noticed that my interviews with my exes, all my interviews with my exes, Martha Card notwithstanding, uh, were adding a real rose-colored tint to my evaluation of the objects, and she wasn't wrong. After every single interview, I'd go in the spreadsheet and increase their scores. So she implemented a rose tint corrector to counteract my nostalgia. So that went in. And by this point, the formula was nearing completion. I had a theater company on board to premiere the show. I was feeling pretty good. Then I took a close look at the budget for the show, and I realized even if we sold out, we would be operating at almost a 7 thousand pound loss, which is not great <laughs> for an endeavor that began as a way to get me out of debt. <laughs> also, at this time, I split up with my long-term, long-distance, on-again, off-again boyfriend for the sixth and final time. <laughs> Not knowing what else to do, I threw myself headlong into my work on this project, into gathering all the necessary information to make the formula something good and useful and accurate. All the long-distance data had to come out because, according to the Center for Study in Long-Distance Relationships, research shows that despite what many people think, LDRs, long-distance relationships, report just as much satisfaction, intimacy, trust, and commitment as traditional relationships. LDRs are not a bad idea. I talked to a psychotherapist who told me that some people have better receptors for love than others based on attachment patterns or wounds formed in childhood. I covered my bedroom in post-it notes, and I wrote to my various collaborators saying things like, we need to factor in your ability to give and receive love, because if it's low, anything you have as a byproduct of it should be more highly prized. Are all loves just antidotes? Are we all just using each other to heal old wounds? And is that such a bad thing? Shouldn't the success of a relationship be measured on a scale of healing versus wounding instead of how long it lasts or whether or not you own property together? Also, I want to do something with the stat that says most people find the one after dating seven and kissing 15. 15? Who's only kissed 15 people? We need to calculate a tipping point for a waste of time. The artistic director of the theater intervened. He said, Haley, if you want this formula to be perfect, it will never be done. He said, you have to stop adding things so you can finish this project. I said, just a few more. <laughs> After nearly driving all of my collaborators away, I agreed to stop adding factors so the formula could be completed and settle for something that was not perfect, but done. <laughs> That's the formula for the cost of love. I write it out when I perform the show. It takes about five minutes. And then I receive the prices for the objects. The prices differ night to night based on the ticket sales and how the audience appraises them before and during the show. Last time I performed the show in London, the sum total of my assets, according to the formula, was 341,398 pounds and 87 P. The price is always both enormous and unsatisfying. The price, I realize, is not the answer, but a byproduct of much bigger lessons. The great gift of the formula is that the number it spits out albeit an ambitious asking price, <laughs> is not zero. And that is no small thing. Working on the show, creating the formula for the cost of love, taught me two big things that seem to be in contradiction, but they're both of great value to me. On one hand, relationships are precarious and uncertain and ever-changing and completely out of our control. And this is something that we know and we forget. 
and we know, and we forget, and we know that we know, we know, we know, and we forget that time will keep moving, our lives will keep unfolding, and how we assess our previous experiences will keep changing. The assessment, the number, the value is temporary, never fixed. And on the other hand, when you forget and you pause to take stock, when the ledger of your life feels like a big zero, I have crunched the numbers, I have proof, it is not zero. It's not. Thank you. <laughs>